My name is Tim Lynch. I'm the director of the Graduate School of Humanities and Social Sciences in the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Melbourne. I teach two electives into the Master of International Relations, US Foreign Policy and Great Power Rivalry. My work is in, uh, when well, I'm not writing uh, encyclopedias, is in modern US foreign policy. Um, and I've written books on the Clinton and, and, and separately on the, on the W. Bush administration. Um, this is the first in a series of three worldwide launches of the Oxford Encyclopedia of American Military and Diplomatic History. Ladies and gentlemen, this book, books, two of them, took me three years to write. I didn't write them. To compile. Uh, I had hair three years ago. <laughs> um, one can imagine going into this process thinking... I had a number of worst-case scenarios, the, for, the for primary one being that academics would turn out to be really as difficult to work with when there's 300 plus of them as I imagined they might be, and that turned out not to be the case. There were some problematic contributors that demanded payment and were otherwise difficult, but 99% offered to me a very reassuring illustration of the good neighbourliness the humanity of people working across the historical and political science disciplines, which makes, make the two core constituencies that are repre represented in the reference work. Um, there are 1,488 pages. There are 450 entries split between 344 authors. Uh, I emigrated to Australia and still this volume tracked me down. Why did I do this? Um, well, I hope that will become evident as we discuss and debate this evening. But let me make this pitch, first of all, that I'm a political... My name is Tim Lynch and I'm a political scientist. Uh, that means, I think, that I need a supply of good history in order to do good political science. There is a relationship between these two approaches which is often elided or ignored, but which is absolutely fundamental. If you are a political scientist, and this is my, my, my anecdotal evidence, there's a constant regression in the focus of inquiry. Political scientists have got back to about 1920. And in 50 years' time, they may have reached 1850, whereas historians, this is their natural territory. Good political science uses good history. There's no tools, really. Or our toolkit is substantially reduced in the absence of it. So that, I think, at an intellectual level, was my motivation for doing it, was to learn history, to work with historians, so as to become a better political scientist and do political science better. So if one looks at the volumes, although the history as a discipline is significantly represented, there is key space that I afforded to good political science, and particularly to good international relations thinkers. It's a very important motivation for me becoming involved in this. So I don't believe in, in I have no truck really with, no, no, not much tolerance for mono-theoretical uh, approaches to the world. I think we are better scholars the more approaches we use, the better we sift uh, different and alternative approaches rather, rather than relying on any one in particular. There's no documented case of an international relations theorist changing his or her mind in the light of new evidence. All they do is re, rework the theory or reapply the theory with greater weight. And surely this is not where we should be. Good IR theory doesn't do that. Um, it's often a, a, occurred to me that historians, perfectly appropriately, are more interested in explaining wars World War I, World War II, the 30-year war, Vietnam, rather than war as a phenomenon. And it seems to me there is space in the discourse about war to try and theorise, to explain what war is and why it happens, rather than simply relying on individual singular case studies. Professor Richard Immerman, um, to my immediate left, is the Edward J. Buthusium family Distinguished Faculty Fellow in History and the Marvin Wackman Director of the Centre for the Study of Force and Diplomacy at Temple University 
in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. From September 2007 till December 2008, Richard served as Assistant Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Analytical Integrity and Standards and Analytical Ombudsman for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, this is a long way of saying he worked for the CIA for the best part of two years under the Bush administration. He currently chairs the Historical Advisory Committee uh, to the Department of State. Uh, in 2009, Professor Immerman began a three-year term as the, Association, uh, the American Historian Association's representative to the Department of State's Advisory Committee on Historical Documentation. His books, uh, his books are basic to the subject that I've spent most of my professional career uh, pursuing. His most recent one is Empire to Liberty, a brilliant study of the history of American imperialism from Benjamin Franklin to Paul Wolfowitz published in 2010, but he's also written uh, a compelling biography of John Foster Dulles, Piety, Pragmatism and Power in US Foreign Policy. He's also very well known for his book, Waging Peace, How Eisenhower Shaped an Enduring Cold War Strategy. Uh, he co-edited the new, very recently released Oxford Handbook of the Cold War, and is presently writing The Hidden Hand, The Brief History of the CIA, which I believe is close to completion. Yes. Yep. Um, he's waiting for clearance now. For, yep. I shouldn't even say that, should I? Um, he, like, uh, like me, Richard has a PhD from Boston College, Massachusetts, only his, his was in the lesser subject of history, whereas mine was in the superior subject of political science. He wrote the entry on... Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower in the encyclopedia that we are uh, launching this evening. John Langmore is professorial fellow and author in the School of Social and Political Sciences here at the University of Melbourne. Uh, in 1984, he was elected as the member for Fraser in the House of Representatives and was re-elected four times. Uh, one of his achievements there was chairing the committee which planned the adoption of the first comprehensive committee system for the House. He retired from Parliament in 1996 and became director of the UN Division for Social Policy and Development in New York for five years and then representative of the International Labour Organization at the UN for two. He was responsible for the organization of the 24th Special Session of the General Assembly, which was the first world conference to agree on a global target for halving serious poverty. John teaches a graduate subject on the United Nations um, and is developing another on international development strategy. Uh, he's published extensively in the media. Uh, his most important book, great book, even though I don't agree with some of it, much of it, still a great book, uh, dealing, with, dealing with America, the UN, the US and Australia, and to firmer ground, restoring hope in Australia. For the encyclopedia, John wrote the keynote entry on US relations with the United Nations. Let me make, uh, before I hand on to my, uh, my fellow panellists, let me make three arguments, or three observations, arguments. Um, the, and I'm claiming editor's prerogative in going first, uh, uh, there are three arguments that I think that are, are missed often or elided or forgotten in, amongst those that study US foreign policy and document US power. Uh, the first is that uh, American foreign policy and thus American power is predicated on a competition uh, internal to the American political system. Very uh, excellent book written about the Abraham Lincoln administration by Doris Kearns Goodwin, one of the first books Obama read as a, as a sitting president was called Team of Rivals. The American Constitution is an invitation to struggle for the control of American foreign policy. If we forget that, if we assume that uh, there is a neat transition path from policy to, from idea to policy to policy effect, we misconstrue and misunderstand what the Constitution obliges American politicians to do. Uh, it is an invitation to struggle. It's a brilliant phrase uh, that Edward Corwin um, 
used to describe the fundamental character of American foreign policy. This means, for example, at a very basic instrumental level, that the president gets to make war, but he can only make war once that war has been declared by Congress. He gets to nominate his Secretary of uh, State, but it's the Senate that must uh, approve it, approve that nomination. So there's a check, there is a check and balance. There is an inherent competition built into the system. This is reflected, I think, in the nature of debate about American power in the United States itself. There are moments of repose and quietude when American foreign policy goes on the back burner. What you tend to find in these eras, the 1990s I think are the last good illustration of this, is that Congress will become more assertive and the President will find it harder to establish his credentials in foreign policy. When there is war and crisis after Pearl Harbor, after 9-11, the President becomes much more powerful. And there is an ebb and flow in this relationship. When the emergency passes, the Civil War, for example, the tools of executive power tend not to endure. They're dismantled. Uh, they leave a legacy, but it's difficult to go. American foreign policy is not a series of emperors expanding, ever expanding the sphere of American dominion. In fact, it's almost the opposite. It's, it's an empire almost by accident, by happenstance. It's empire without great executive presidential leadership, often. So that's the first argument, that competition is basic to the way the system functions. The second argument I'd like to offer is that we miss the fundamental, much longer history of success of American foreign policy. We are compromised, I think in some ways appropriately so, by recent travails in the Middle East, disastrously executed war in Iraq and a war of interminable duration with no obvious end point in Afghanistan to the point where America is simply withdrawing. We forget, if we, our focus is too narrow, that America went from diddly squat, from nothing, from irrelevance 226 years ago to being not just the most important power today, but the most important global power, most important power in world history. Not just in military terms, but in economic terms. One could argue in cultural terms. There's something, and I know many of you will say, well, it's, they had better weather. They are, most of their land is arable. Well, of course, these are, these are helpful, natural, God-given attributes. But we, in focusing on them alone, we forget it's the system that allow for this remarkable rise. And a system which is contentious, which is sometimes compromised by argument, which is, is so driven by ideological exchange that you reach gridlock. And yet the United States has used this system to go from nothing to everything in a little over 200 years. Ponder the alternative ideological models. All those states that either rose directly against American power or some no, against some notion of Western capitalism, the Soviet Union. Remember the Soviet Union? This rickety old heap of bureaucracy held together for 70 years before it crumbled. The contention at the beginning of that project was that they could remake mankind, tweak, transform the nature of government, it'll change human nature. And yet it was the system that the Soviets claimed would collapse and at which they would be present at the burial of that was present at the burial of the Soviet Union. China, France, all had revolutions designed to revolutionize concepts of government and change human nature. They all either fell as revolutionary movements or had to adapt to the far cannier American experiment. The French have never gotten over the fact that it was the Americans that had to liberate them in 1944-5. It should have been them that were liberating the world. Instead, it was the, the nasty traders, the dollar-driven capitalists that enjoyed that, that success. So look at the competitors that set themselves up against what America was engaged in, and they all fell. German power, Russian power, French power, all the states, the big states, even, even Britain you could extend, England, you could extend the, the example base that far. All states that had a revolution to, to, to make something new 
were compromised and beaten by the American experiment. Something about American foreign policy works. Let me suggest, and I'm not the first to do it, Walter Russell Mead does this very effectively in his, in his work, but in some sense, all these other ones failed because they were monotheoretical. They were based on the absurd notion that one ideology had all the answers. Fascists, communists, Nazis, Maoists. Whereas the United States, there is no one controlling influence. They are free marketeers, they are isolationists, they are interventionists, they are internationalists. The state itself is founded against empire and yet they find themselves in possession of one of the world's most remarkable empires. No one group, unless you, you believe the American system can be hijacked by cabals, I assure you it can't. The neoconservatives are more remarkable for the absence of influence they had, not for the extent of it. If you believe that the American system can be hijacked by a small group, I don't think you understand the American system, which because it's disputatious, contentious, and remarkably open, even given the exposure that WikiLeaks has, has, has had and has revealed, it's a remarkably porous system. That's its strength. It was Alexis de Tocqueville, his claim, he was right about everything except this one point. Uh, he said America would fall because of the decentralization of its foreign policy making power. You had to be like Paris or Moscow or Berlin. You had to have centrally directed by a king or a president control of foreign policy. Otherwise, you'd fall victim to foreign invasion. The United States did not have, to, that's wrong. We know the United States has prospered and has become more secure the more democratic it has remained. My final point. Um, we, there is far more continuity in the history of American foreign policy and in the evolution of American power than we are prepared to give credit for. I wrote a book about this a few years ago uh, and its opening epigraph was a, a, uh, the Romanian proverb, a change of leaders is the joy of fools. Those who are so short-sighted, naive to believe that changing governments in democracies really matters uh, need to stop and rethink that. I'm not going to get into the debate about the, pre the, 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 the election which is underway on the, in, on the continent we're now in, but it seems to me uh, we can expect, in terms of Australian foreign policy, far less change irrespective of who wins in September. The same is, I think, true even more so of the United States. Presidents, candidates run fiercely. We've just lived through this experience, and we do so every four years. They campaign fiercely on this false premise that they will revolutionize American foreign policy, and they very rarely do it. My two case studies, and I'm going to defer, of course, to the, the expertise of Richard here very greatly, but I don't think I'm, I'm wrong in this. Uh, in 1952, I think it was the, the last great occasion where foreign policy was this, a substantial focus of the campaign, with one tired, unpopular president losing a global war, being replaced by a man, Dwight Eisenhower, that contended he would revolutionise the approach, make, put, turn American foreign policy back to winning ways, face down this global threat. Well, we saw, and what do we see through the 1950s? We saw the reapplication under Eisenhower of methods and approaches which Truman pursued. This echoed, I think, uncannily in the transition from uh, George W. Bush to Barack Obama. In some ways, Obama, and many, I know some people still live with this delusion that Obama presaged something new. In some ways, the power of his rhetoric was to promise something old. That was where the reassurance lay. In 2008, he promised a revolution away from Bush and has spent the last four and a bit years offering, giving us a competent version of the Bush doctrine. He's killed more terrorists. He killed more terrorists in, the fir in his first year in office, Obama, than Bush killed in his eight or the seven after 9-11. He was complicit in regime change in a Muslim country, regime change which commanded no UN mandate. Imagine if George Bush had done that. And he killed Osama bin Laden, enemy number one, the, the uh, uh, dead or alive, the object of the dead or alive rhetoric of George W. Bush. Well, it was the Chicago international community organizer that delivered that man's head on a plate. Uh, we're dealing with a foreign policy which changes very little. 
certainly and especially, I'm not trying to make the argument, there is no foreign policy change ever, clearly. Why would you study something that doesn't change? Well, when it comes to national security, the structure of the system makes change very slow. It's impossible for one man, he is one man, surrounded by political opponents who are far more numerous, whose dedicated mission is to ruin his pres presidency or promote their own agenda. This dynamic explains why foreign policy turns only really very slowly. Why demonising or eulogising particular presidents is a fool's errand, because they're all trapped in the same structural circumstance. So let me close by saying that we forget that competition is good and basic, that rule by experts and an end to democratic exchange and name calling uh, is not an appropriate model for the American system. It produces gridlock, but it also produces greatness, measured crudely from going from nothing to everything. American foreign policy works. Look at its opponents. Look at the people that stand against it. The outliers, the crazy rogue states, Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, a viable model to replace American power? This is what this great balancing coalition to American capitalism looks like? So it works, and it's marked by continuity. These three ingredients, I think, oblige us as students of American power to recognise, even if we don't have to accept completely, a far longer and deeper record of success than of failure. Thank you. I'm now going to hand, to, hand over to Professor Immerman. By dropping the A-bomb, that's not proof of American militarism, it's a proof that he wanted to safeguard something close to a million lives on both sides. And by dropping the atomic bomb, those lives were saved instead of having to reconquer every island against a fierce opponent. Uh, the very difficult decision. In fact, correct me if I'm mistaken on this, Richard, it wasn't a difficult decision for Truman in the sense that he did a cost-benefit an analysis. He thought more Americans and more Japanese would live as a consequence of dropping the bomb than they're not doing. Um, so he dropped it. But there is no justification for it being dropped twice. Well, it, well, I think that that's a more intriguing question. Uh, and it's dropped twice, of course, to show primarily that you can produce more than one. He, he actually only had two. So, um, yeah. <laughs> but it, it shows you've got uh, a production line. Right. I, mean, I, I, but, I mean, to answer your question, some, I mean, uh, for Truman not to have dropped the bomb, he would have actually had to reverse the decision to drop the bomb. The bomb was, was developed with the notion that if it were available, it would be used to end the war. Harry Truman, who of course didn't even know the bomb was developed when he became president, was not in a position, was not going to, I think, not to, to sort of reverse the, all of that momentum without a compelling reason to do so. And since he did want to save lives, and if he weighed lives between American lives and Japanese lives, it was not going to be close as to what he was going to do. He, he dropped the bomb. Having said that, did American policy change then at that point? It's the answer was really no, um, in part because um, we now had this power, although we didn't have many bombs and we didn't have the delivery capability. Um, but we didn't really know what to do with it. And at that point, the hope was still to maintain some sort of cooperative relationship with the Soviet Union um, along the lines that Roosevelt had envisioned. It was really over the next couple years that we begin to see change in the development of what ultimately comes to be called the national security state um, and then you begin to see a change in American foreign policy, including a commitment to remain active in the international arena, to ally with other powers during peacetime, therefore breaking Washington's great rule, to permanently station American troops overseas. That was pretty revolutionary. But that did not happen after August 9th, 1945, 
it went into 1947 and 48 and, and beyond. It really wasn't until 1950 that it, it sort of institutionalized. First question is, um, without being too facetious, Japan decide, um, I would say that Donald Duck was a greater statesman than Douglas MacArthur was. So it, it wasn't just sort of Eisenhower. How did what? Why did he keep quoting him if he was on Well, that's, uh, you, you asked about a question about sort of statesmanship, not sort of who was quotable or, you know, other things like that. I mean, MacArthur did some wonderful things, but as a statesman, um, he, he, that wasn't his strong suit, let's put it that way. Could I just say, though, that his injunction, never get involved in the ground war in Asia, was in fact the most statesmanlike statement of any American general, or maybe even president. I, I didn't get that. The decision not to enter into a ground war in Asia was, a, was prescient. Well, yeah, but that, that was not, I mean, the ground war in, in Asia, MacArthur wanted to bomb China. He wanted to nuke them. You know, to nuke China. That's part of what I was saying about sort of statesmanship. The, the, the question about that national security and national security mm. state, it may not be the, the answer to the question that you want, but it's always struck me that with the, this is a common caricature that after 1945, because of the expansion of executive power that the Second World War brought about, that the national security state clearly became more powerful and sucked in more resources. Uh, this did not, John talks of empirical evidence, but let me suggest in, in broad brushstrokes, the effect of the creation of the national security state was the 1960s, the counterculture, the pill, abortion, criminal rights, civil rights, a flourishing of protest movements culminating in the resignation of a president in 1974. America didn't become more draconian or centralized. The dark night of fascism did not begin with the creation of the national security state. In some ways, the national security state, and this is ironic, created the conditions that allow for the 1960s and 70s to come about. So we, we misconstrue, we connect the development of things like the CIA with this a dark manifestation of power. And in some ways, it was the, had the opposite effect. But one, just one reply to that, uh, one consequence of, of the strength of the national security state in the US is that it's spent somewhere between 4% and 7% of its national income every year since 1945 on, on the military and therefore has not been able to address the poverty oh, or the I deprivation that's, 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 that, that's, that's, that's that any any self-respecting social democratic country would have been able it's, to it's do. It spends five times the amount on social security, Medicare, Medicaid, as it does on defence. Defence is, is the least problematic item of the federal budget. And we think about the diminution of American power that we've seen since the GFA, not an acronym that the Americans use, post-2008. It had very little to do with the Iraq, the Iraq and Afghanistan war, and much more to do with easy credit convincing people that couldn't afford houses that they could. That's had a far more devastating impact on American power than the foreign wars they've been engaged in. And the long-term consequence, the greatest problem facing the Republic is not military spending, it's how you fund the elderly. It's been remarkable at, create, at extending uh, life expectancy. The problem is how do you fund it? And that's, if it's in free fall, if the, the system is collapsing, it's collapsing far more for that reason than for anything attached to its military adventurism. 5% of national income is over 20% a, a uh, of, uh, of total central government expenditure. 25% of the federal budget goes on welfare, broadly construed. And, and another 20% another could go on that if, if that wasn't uh, being well spent then, on Well, then the we're arguing about the welfare state and whether it's appropriate simply to fund, to fund that. Um, and that's a different philosophical question, it seems to me. But the military is not your problem. It's social welfare spending. That's what's crippling the US. In some ways, this is America's great 
um, great attribute that for most of its history it's been interested in trade. While Europeans were killing themselves for ideological, racial, class-based reasons, the United States were getting rich, ducking and weaving, cutting deals, which led to uh, the expansion of their economic system. Um, I find it difficult to take a question seriously that cites Noam Chomsky in, in anything other than uh, non-deferential terms, but even if he, if he's slightly right, I would argue the consequences of that have been far better. A state with this much power that's only really interested in getting rich instead of making us good or turning us into a classless society or some notion of humankind based on racial superiority is infinitely, it's infinitely preferable in ter when compared to states thus predicated and so dedicated. I'll just, here, I'll, I'll, I'll play the historian again. Um, corporate, corporate capitalism and economic interests are a driver of U.S. foreign relations. They're not the only driver of U.S. foreign relations. Um, security and, and geopolitics matter. Uh, there certainly are those who believe strongly in America's mission in one way. They're often related. There's the, the, there is the notion that the most secure United America, the most prosperous America, is also an, an America that um, inhabits a non-hostile world, and that world will be largely like America, um, subscribing to American values. Um, so it's, it's a lot. I think, I mean, people like Chomsky, that, that a linguist can write about foreign policy in the way that he can, I think exhibits some of the problems we have in our scholarship in which he does identify one thing and hammers it, to, it, it over and over. Gabriel Coco, I think, gives a much more sophisticated um, assessment of that than, than someone like Noam Chomsky, um, in part because he, he knows, although he'll ultimately come to the same conclusions. Um, I don't think that anyone intended to omit corporate power from one of the drivers. Um, the question is whether it is constantly and always the primary driver. When in terms of the Vietnam War, that was one of the big issues, was trying to figure out where corporate power fit in. And yes, there was the argument about Japan and falling dominoes and other things, but that didn't get us very far in really understanding what the motivations were for the United States to get involved in a very tragic and, and mistaken war. First of all, in terms of the, the, the pivot towards Asia, I think most of us who are historians of foreign policy are still waiting to see us pivot. Um, that it is declared policy, uh, whether or not, I mean, it's not as if the United States has abandoned its traditional interests in Europe and elsewhere. Um, the China market has been a, a part of American foreign policy going back at least a century. Um, I think the, the real question is what are the motivations? How much of it is containment of China and how much of that is exploiting a market to help um, address the, the, the trade and financial problems the United States is facing? I think it's a very logical policy that the United States would have developed, which is to try to reach out more to Asia. That is a growing market, growing source of resources and others. The debate is over China um, and whether this is an offensive or a defensive type of policy and whether or not the United States can develop a, a, a harmonious relationship or a competitive relationship with China. And I think the jury is still out, including in Washington. Um, I think there's a great division as to what what this really is. So you, um, and, and it's certainly all through the journals or whatever, whether China is a, a, a competitor and a threat or China is actually an asset to be exploited. I personally think it's more the latter, um, but we'll, we'll see how it works out. My reply would be very much the same, really. Uh, I, I think the pivot towards Asia, so-called, is just a reflection of reality. Uh, uh, Asia is growing economically so strongly, America must take it more seriously. But what the implications of that are for security policy, I think are being uh, vigorously debated, and I don't think there's any clarity yet 
in, uh, in the US or probably in China. I mean, uh, both countries have, have, uh, have uh, uh, people of widely different views and who's going to prevail in both countries is not at all clear. I, I mean, I agree with all of that. Um, the pivot towards Asia started on December the 7th, 1941. America has been engaged in various degrees uh, ever since. Packaging it as a, some revolution or a shift, I think, masks the fundamental continuity. Richard Nixon's greatest foreign policy legacy is bringing China into the international system. Mm. That was a pivot to Asia. Uh, whether Obama can muster anything appro approximating the remarkable qualities of that, that diplomatic episode, are, 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 I'm sceptical of. But it suits many in the region we're in to think of the pivot as reflecting an assumption that we're in the Asian century. I think that's a notion that's very poorly defined and much misunderstood. Um, but I, I think the more America exerts its influence in Asia, the better the prospects for accommodation and compromise and trade in Asia. So I'd, if it's a pivot towards Asia, I'd be, I'd be in favor of it. In much the same way, I was in favor of America's pivot towards Europe after its pivot towards Asia in 1941. The consequences of a withdrawal or refusal to intercede in Europe um, would have been far, would have been devastating. Um, so I'm all for the extension of sensible, rational American imperium. It, it, that's a very complex question to answer. Uh, but one aspect of it is that China is spending more on research than as a proportion of its national income than, than the US is doing. Uh, I think it's fairly hard to draw an exact uh, parallel between the level of democracy and and the level of innovativeness. There's clearly a lot of innovative capacity in China. Uh, it may well be hampered uh, if China uh, uh, acts in an, in an entirely autocratic way, but of course it's in fact a relative, in, in some ways, a fairly decentralized society also. So it, it's a complex <laughs> question to answer, and I don't think this is the moment to try it really seriously. Um, I mean, it, it is very tough. I mean, from there was a cardinal rule, um, at least in terms of American foreign policy, that the policy was only as, as successful as the domestic support it could generate. Um, that has, has been a norm, and, and, and we can look at many different examples of that. Based on that, um, one would question as to how um, expansive China's influence will ultimately be if it does not be able to mobilize more support throughout the, the, the country. Having said that, and I, said, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm not an expert on China. What I, what I can say is that this entire conversation has taken place um, as if the state system is back in the, the 17th or 18th century and that this phenomenon called globalization was really not a variable. Um, it, looking 20, 30, 40 years from now, and whenever China would overtake the United States in terms of the global leadership of the economy, and, and predictions vary, it's very difficult to know how the state system will be um, interacting with one another and the extent to which, uh, you know, whether it be individual you know, financial concerns or others and the independence that we'll have developed could really significantly revise or, or change the types of great power rivalries that we have conventionally seen. And I don't have a crystal ball to be able to look that far ahead. But I do have the sense that if China's economy develops the way it does, that there will be growing interdependence with the American economy and that some of this competition that, that we take for granted um, will not be nearly as intense if it's not more sort of a, a synergetic or, or a symbiotic type of relationship. Mm. I don't know, but as I said, we haven't really talked much about these types of changing international um, power relationships um, throughout the evening. Mm. One of the 
reasons China occupies such a important place in American political discourse, well, of course, because of its, its America's banker, but it's also because unlike Israel as an issue, unlike Russia during the Cold War as an issue, China engenders no clear partisan grouping. The, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are essentially evenly split between pessimists and optimists about uh, Chinese power. Republicans believe that trade will set them free. The, more, uh, they, the wealthier they get, the more that will lead to demands for freedom, whereas Democrats are cool on human rights abuses. So there's no one core camp driving a particular American conception, which I think, is, to go back to my original pitch, is illustrative of how lively exchange, debate and discourse within American politics opens up opportunities where in, more, where in closed systems they would, be, they would be closed down. 